So they, uh, the, our last speaker is Dr. Jack Shonkov. Um, he's the, um, uh, he's the uh, Julius um, Rich Richmond FAMRI Professor of Child Health and Development at the Harvard School of Public Health and Harvard Graduate School of Education. He's the Professor of Pediatrics at Harvard Medical School and Boston Children's Hospital. And he's the Director of the University University-wide center on the developing child at Harvard University. He currently serves as the chair. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> there are still three lines of the introduction. So <laughs> let me just, yeah. He's also an elected member of the Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Science. And yeah, welcome. Thank you. <laughs> So I, uh, I apologize that I'm standing be between you and the reception. So, um, but let me tell you. So I'm going to I'm going to try to pull this day together, um, partly in the service of preventing most of you from walking out in the middle of my presentation, to be a little bit provocative about pulling together the whole day and picking up on that last comment. I think I'll address that. Okay. So I, for me, the issue here is how can we take this rapidly growing science and the passion of people like Nadine and Burke Harris and uh, drive innovation that will actually address something that we've had very little conversation about today, which is how do we use all of this to make much bigger impacts on outcomes for children as they grow up? I mean, I think that's the real issue. So um, a lot of the science we've talked about today has really, in spades, addressed the why question. Why should we care about what happens early in life? And there's a lot of information out there about the what question, which is what should we do with this knowledge in terms of policies and practices. Um, but the problem is that the what question, and it's how we moved into what I'm going to talk with you about this afternoon, um, basically tells us how we can move the needle a little bit if we kind of invest resources and mobilize public support. But it doesn't tell us how we can move the needle a lot. And so what I'd like to do is pull the day together and talk about what's next. So what could, what will the content of the Pickhower Institute Symposium 10 years from now be about that will say, could you believe what they thought in 2014? Could you believe that? They actually thought that that was the case? Because the fact is that most of what we do today, other than the science, which is moving rapidly, on the policy and practice side, there isn't a lot we can say about 10 years ago or 20 years ago, so I can't believe they did that back then because we're still doing a lot of the same thing. That's the challenge here. So if we move from why should we care so much about early adversity and what do we know about how to improve life outcomes and what's next, um, it's a food fight uh, to kind of get to the issue of, so what do we do about this other than say, let's invest in good programs that have a good evidence base. That's not the promised land. Okay? Um, so we'll just start with a kind of few points to frame all of this. Um, so I like to think of the work that we do as kind of multicultural. We try to live with credibility in the science world, in the policy world, in the practice world, and to leverage the science to have any kind of impact. And you know, Pat did, as always, a magnificent job. The complexity of the science has to be translated into something that is simple for people to understand, but not dummy down. And you know, I don't know. There's this long list of Einstein quotes. I don't know whether he said all these things or not, but they're they're great <laughs> quotes. You ever said. So he said, I had to pick out one that wasn't too offensive to scientists, but he said, you know, if you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. So there has been a lot of really elegant science talked about today that unless its complexity is captured in a simple way, has no impact on people who make decisions. And Yuri Bronfenbrenner, uh, a developmental psychologist who was one of the founders of, of Head Start, had a wonderful quote. He said, if you really want to understand something, try to change it. And I think that's our marching orders for this. It's the extent to which we get better and better at understanding the impact of adversity on long-term health. Unless we can change those outcomes, we don't, our understanding is not achieving what we want to do. So, but there's a flip side to this, um, which is digging deeper into the complexity is an absolute prerequisite for breakthrough impacts. I will tell you from my own experience that until a few years ago, along with Pat and Phil Fisher and others who've been part, of this group, we worked very hard at educating non-scientists scientists about the science and actually had made a fair amount of progress in a lot of places of people really getting the message about why this stuff is important, okay? 
but we didn't give them an answer about what to do about it. And the answer was, well, invest in evidence-based programs. The problem is the evidence-based programs make a marginal difference. They make a difference, it's statistically significant, it's better than nothing, but it's not enough. So in order to make breakthrough impacts, we have to dig deeper and then come back up again and speak in words that people can understand. So I don't know how many of you read um, Walter Isaacson's biography of Steve Jobs. It's a great read if you haven't read it. Uh, Johnny Eve, who was his head of industrial design, you know, has this wonderful quote in the book. Um, Apple was obsessed with simplicity, you know, so you'd get the not one more button on any of these gadgets that it needs to have. But in order to get a product that really worked and that was elegant in its simplicity, they had to dig deep into the depths of the complexity. They had to really go really deep to deeply understand the essence of a product. In this case, it was an iPad or an iPod or an iPhone. For us, the product is a policy or an intervention that will have a much bigger impact than anything we do right now. We have to be able to dig deep into the complexity, get rid of the parts that you don't need, and get to the active ingredients because it is a, it is a, no, it is a no sale in this environment to say we need comprehensive, community-based, multi-dimensional, integrated programs that kind of pull everything together. That's a synonym for expensive. And the other dominant frame that, that we have learned that Pat didn't have a chance to talk about because of the time constraints is the public's perception of doing something about adversity related to poverty, discrimination, violence is futility. The public's perception and policymakers say it's too complicated. There's nothing we can do about that. And we don't help when we say, if they say, so how do we undertake this? We say, well, it's very complicated. It's really, there's no simple answer, which is true, but we have to go deep into the complexity, which is why the richness of the science today was so powerful. But it doesn't translate into a rallying cry to know what to do. So let me tell you a little bit about, first, try to make a transition from where the compelling scientific frontier questions are that the policy and practice community needs science to dig deeper into, and then show how we're thinking about applying this to actually changing what happens out there on the ground. So there were basically three domains that have been reflected in almost every talk today that we need a deeper dive into, and then some coherent, powerful messages to come back up to the policymakers and the practitioners. First is we need a much deeper understanding of the mechanisms and pathways through which adverse experiences get into children's brains and get into their bodies and lead to lifelong problems in learning, behavior, and physical and mental health. It's these, this deeper understanding of causal mechanisms are the ingredients of new ideas about what to try in intervention sense. And what we've done, and I'll put myself up there as guilty, as charged, for what we did up until a couple of years ago was we felt the answer was to just tell the story and have people say, oh, wow, I get it, which is what happened. You know, the, the science is very powerful out there in the policy world. And then people said, okay, let's do something. What should we do? You know, do home visiting, set up center-based programs, have pre-K, have Head Start programs, and it just, that's not the breakthrough impact. So we need a deeper understanding of causal mechanisms. Thank you, scientific community, for digging deeper into that. Second, something that's been touched on a lot today, but we have not, no one has addressed this in the policy arena, is to get a deeper understanding of how the relative impacts of adversity vary with age. Beginning, now we talk about the prenatal period, it's probably pre, the preconceptional health of a woman before she becomes pregnant, which is now getting into the outcomes of the early childhood programs, which kind of keeps the cycle going. But we talk, and even today, most of the time we've talked about the importance of early childhood. Well, early childhood, there's a difference between six months of age, 12 months of age, two years of age, four years of age prenatally. And we desperately need not only better scientific understanding that, but the policy world needs to understand what should we be doing in infancy that's different from what we should be doing at age three or age four, and what about the prenatal period? It's not just about early is better. That's the rallying cry, but now it's like, what are we going to do? And we need that timing issue, particularly on critical and sensitive periods. But of course, now we're learning that even the most immutable critical periods may not be irreversible anymore. So it just opens up a whole range of possibilities. <clears throat> the third is individual differences. <clears throat> That's been a subtext for a lot of presentations today. About, so it starts 
with this notion of even the successful interventions that make an impact. You know, we talk about mean effects, but the reality is some kids do really well with these interventions and some kids don't do well at all. And the most disadvantaged kids often don't even get into the program so they don't stay. Okay? And mean differences, which is what drives this field. You know, the question is, does the program work? Not who does it work for, who does it work better for, who does it work less for, it's does the program work. S the, the policy and practice community needs from the research community its deepest understanding of how gene environment interaction and epigenetic effects early on help explain differences in vulnerability and resilience and help explain issues about so what's early, it's, not, it's the timing, it's the, it's the interaction, it's the vulnerability, it's the resilience, it's the decreasing plasticity over time so that the message from the scientific community is how to think differently about what to do, not to mention for different target populations. You know, we have a huge epidemiologic literature that people have struggled with. This notion that adversity produces bad outcomes. <laughs> well, thank you, Richard. You know, Plato talked about that, right? And these are, these are not new ideas, but we have much greater insights now into this, but we're not translating these insights into new strategies for intervention. We're translating them into let's do something about this. So science needs to help us figure this out. So now I'm going to take the rest of my time to show you, I have no data to present. Well, actually, that's not true. I have a little bit of data to present. But mostly to show you how we're trying to think about how a rapidly moving science frontier can change the thinking on the ground in practice and in policy to develop new hypotheses, new ideas, and test them. And, and particularly, you know, Mark Baer mentioned in his talk, it was a wonderful illustration of how, you know, you got the science down pat, you've got all the mechanisms, so now all you have to do is make the drug, right? Well, no, it's not that easy. So I think most of us would agree that it's at least as complicated, if not more complicated, to figure out how to turn this science into what to do about poverty and violence as opposed to what to do about amblyopia, right? It's a little bit more complicated, so it doesn't just translate. And what we need is also an environment that will allow us to do what all good science translation does, which is to try some things and know the first things are going to fail and learn from them. This is what NICHD and others just don't understand, is that what we've been missing is learning from things that don't work. People get funded only for things that work. We publish only results of what works. We miss the opportunity to learn important lessons from things that don't work. So we have, this is, we'll be hearing a lot about this in the next year or so, where we're just about at the 50th anniversary of the war on poverty. Um, Head Start was created, neighborhood health centers were created, job training programs for people were created, food stamps were created, all of these things didn't exist before then. 50 years ago, the best minds in the country the best scientists, but most of them were social scientists. There wasn't a lot of biology. There was no biology at the table then, but there was a lot of good scientific investigation. Came together with policymakers, and they created policies and programs to do what we've been talking about all day, to shift the, the curve, move the needle, and produce better outcomes. Half a century, okay? What's happened in half a century? Um, so I'm not going to talk about all the stress-related diseases. A lot's been said about that. But what about infant mortality? So infant mortality, you know, kind of continues to come down. Um, but the racial differences and ethnic disparities in infant mortality haven't budged. I'm just giving you the last 30 years. They haven't budged. And most of infant mortality in this country is related to prematurity. Not all of it, but a lot of it is prematurity. And so most people say, well, obviously, we're not doing a good job of providing prenatal care. Well, guess what? Prenatal care is not the, is not the answer to this. It's, we've studied that. It's not about prenatal care. It's about some other things, and probably not just one thing. And probably it has something to do with adversity and stress. Okay, this is an area where no progress has been made, and the answer is not more science to say how bad adversity is. This is a window into new thinking about the prenatal period. Um, this is the same 30, this is a 50 year view of this, you know, obsession that we have with trying to reduce the achievement gap in the country. So the good news is in 50 years, this is what's happened to racial disparities in reading, okay? They've come down dramatically. They're still unacceptably high, but they're much lower than they were. This is what uh, disparities by family income looks like. Around about uh, in the early 80s, which is when this growing inequality started, there's a lot of talk about that. Well, in fact, the gap by income now in reading is as large as the gap was by race in the 1960s, and the relationship is reversed. And what's even more 
dispiriting about this is that over this same period, the average educational level of low-income mothers has increased. Studies show that low-income women with limited education are talking to their kids more, they're reading to their kids more, and they're falling, their kids are falling further behind. And on top of that, the goalposts have been moved because it used to be a high school graduation that kind of got you economic security and now it gets you nothing. So some of this is related to the fact that the educated part of the population is using this science to provide learning opportunities for their kids before school started that nobody thought about before. But here's the question, how much of this growing gap is related to the impact of adversity on the brain development of children living in poverty in this environment where the stresses on families are at least as great if not greater than they used to be because now most people are working, single parent or two parent families. When we started, it was one parent at home who we needed to teach to talk to the child more. And we, so there's huge kind of questions about how much progress are we making on this. Um, so let me kind of end up in the last few minutes with telling you how the science we've been talking about today is just sitting there waiting to be mobilized for a kind of a new way of thinking about science and foreign policy and practice. So the conceptual framework that guides our early childhood policies today is essentially the conceptual framework that was created 50 years ago. There really have been no major breakthrough thinking on that. It goes something like this. Some combination of providing stimulating learning opportunities for children, often in center-based programs, parenting education to teach parents the kind of things that they need to know to help promote healthy development for their children, access to a medical home, primary health care, good nutrition, and safe environments that minimize um, injuries and, and other threats to well-being. A combination of those will lead to readiness to succeed in school. That's what our early childhood agenda is about. It's about school readiness. Okay? And um, in many cases, this works. And for some part even of the poor population, this works, but there's a significant part of the population for whom this doesn't work. It's not enough. And we could all agree after today that a reasonable hypothesis is that the reason this isn't working for the part of the population that is not making any progress is that the level of adversity in the lives of the families and the children overwhelms what primary health care and advice for parents and a good preschool program can provide. That's, there it is, there's the setup for, okay, now what can science have to say? And up till the last couple of years, even for our own work, what we had was science had to say, the stuff that Pat beautifully illustrated, we can tell you, we can teach you about the importance of early experiences, we can teach you about problems of adversity, but, and as Pat was one of the best people on this, say, but don't ask the neuroscientists what kind of what kind of programs to do? That's not their expertise. Let's ask the people who do programs. And a lot of the people who do programs, talk about adapting to your environment, right? We have a half a century of people who've adapted to the environment that basically said you're fighting for survival, you're fighting for funding. Don't talk about things you're not accomplishing. Find your best data, make your best case, and stay in business. That's, that's adaptive, that's good, that allows you to live long enough to reproduce and get your next generation of people working in it. And it's, it's not, there's nothing wrong with it in terms of progress that we're making a difference, but it's not closing those gaps, okay? So, um, I'm sorry, I'll call on Einstein once more on this. If you always do what you always did, you will always get what you always got. Um, which means that if our answer to all this science is now we really know how important it is to make sure that kids have good early education and parents get information and we assure primary care with immunizations and anticipatory guidance. Somehow things will get better, much better. I don't mean marginally better, but much better because we have big gaps to fill. Remember, social class disparities in all the health parameters for kids haven't budged in decades. They just haven't gotten any smaller. So here's how we're using the science. What's been talked about today the concepts, not the molecular mechanisms yet, right, but the concepts to basically change the narrative for early childhood policy and practice. The narrative has to be changed. It has to, we have to mobilize the science to go beyond the first step, which we've accomplished in many places, is to get people to pay attention to the fact that early matters. You know, 10 years ago, there were lots of states where if you talked about the importance of early experience on brain development, and what the public response should be, that was the end of the conversation, right? Now there isn't a state in this country that isn't trying to figure out what its early childhood investment should be, 
and I was at a UNICEF meeting a month ago. It's now a global issue about the impact of toxic stress. On it's it's like it's like it's the next now what as we reduce infant mortality now what okay in the poorest countries in the world so less kids are dying the job is hardly done that these kids are still alive now in very tough environments so from our perspective here's an example of two very powerful kind of propositions almost paradigm shift propositions that come out of the science we've been talked about talking about today first is that early experiences affect both lifelong health and learning. This is like, duh, for this group. But in the policy world, it's about school readiness. It's not about health. It's not about we're going to reduce you know, heart disease decades later. And what's even almost more distressing, as some of you may be familiar, one of the iconic early childhood intervention studies was the Abbasidarian Project done in North Carolina in the early 1970s, a few years after the, the mother of all uh, early childhood interventions, the Perry Preschool Project. So Abbasidarian was, uh, was a high-risk population with a randomized control trial of about 110 kids in each group. And it started with, in the first two or three months of life, five years of intensive 12-month-a-year uh, rich early childhood care and education program with some kind of non-obligatory non parent involvement. And it produced statistically significant differences in school achievement and some lasting effects on a number of measures. And the, the, the treatment group were kind of economically doing better than the control group as adults, but still, you know, not turning their lives around completely. So there was some fo long-term follow-up data that were recently collected that found a treatment controlled group difference, I think at about age 30 something years now, uh, in blood pressure. Okay, so the headlines came out. The paper was published, headlines came out. Peri Abbasidarian Project produ uh, produced lifelong change, reduced hypertension in adulthood. Um, therefore, um, it also has a health impact. Well, I, whether, you know, regardless of how you want to think about that, it's, it's you know, there, this, there's a, maybe a there there, but what's the causal mechanism? How do we take that and translate that into what we should be doing in 2014 or 2015, other than saying, oh good, let's do that program that they did in 1972, um, because it had a blood pressure effect. 30 years later, so now we have an impact on health, not just an impact on school readiness. Where's, where's the 40 years of deeper insight into causal mechanisms, into how you translate that into what the active ingredient should be in the intervention? That's our job, that, that's, that's our task. So that's the first one. The second one, which is even more important than what I want to end on with some examples, is that the science is screaming at us that healthy development requires not just the enrichment that we provide, but a balanced approach to both protection for developing organs, especially the brain, and enrichment for the developing mind, right? There is no protection function in these programs. It's giving information. It's providing experiences. What do we do about protecting the developing brain and the cardiovascular system and the immune system from excessive activation of stress responses across the board? So because we are driven by science, we, we don't go from this to a program. <laughs> We go from this to some hypotheses uh, that need to be tested that in the beginning will certainly not be the answer, but will move us down the road because we won't stop. We will not stop until we produce much bigger impacts than anything else that's been provided. So there were, there, here's, here's an example of a, of a hypothesis that's really driven by the science we talked about today. If we need to provide a combination of protection and enrichment for young children in the environment of relationships in which they grow up, then we have to do some capacity building in the adults who care for them. Giving parents information and advice when regardless of what their own ACE score is and who are living in poverty and dealing with violence and, and potential intimate partner violent relationships and depression and substance abuse, um, we need to do more than just say, talk to your child, read to your child, this will help build strong brain. We need to build those skills because a lot of these skills we're not developed early on in life. This is the prefrontal cortex. These are these executive functions, self-regulation, and mental health capacities. And so um, this is wide open territory because Head Start had a mandatory parent involvement component to it. And it's 50 years later and people are still discussing what, how do we get parents involved in the program? And this is a big issue in the early childhood field. How do we get parents involved? We, 50 years ago, we said it was important we haven't figured that out yet. Well, now it's not just involvement, it's skill building because we know that these skills, these skills are necessary to buffer children against 
the impacts of adversity, and also to scaffold the development of these skills in children when they're young so that they can build their own capacities for dealing with stress and for dealing with threat, and that doesn't come in on automatic pilot. It's all about the serve and return interaction with adults. It's all about that, and if the adults don't have those skills, they can't scaffold those skills in the children. So as, here's the benefit of bringing people together from different fields, because we started with a bunch of early childhood people, right? And, but we brought into the room people who deal with other policy issues, and one of them said, these skills you're talking about sound, I get it, they're kind of good for parenting, but they also sound like the skills you need to get a job. And we realized that we were talking about foundational capabilities for being a successful adult. That we can't think about what do you need to be a parent? What do you need to get a job and be employable at a higher level? What do you need to kind of be economically stable and to be kind of socially engaged? We can't have five programs coordinated with each other, one for parenting, one for workforce, because those other programs are struggling with the same thing. So, we, so we're looking to science now and looking to our understanding of the development of the prefrontal cortex to say, what are those foundational skills you need to be an adult who is successful in life? upon which parenting and employability and other skills are relying on. So that's, if you want to know where the data are, oh, we've just started to kind of try to put some ideas on the ground. But what we're doing is we're bringing scientists together with people who are providing services, who, for whom, and this, we get this back all the time, um, who are so hungry for new ideas, right? And so how do you find out who to work with? You find the best programs out there who everybody says are the most effective, and you pick out of that group the people who say, I'm not happy with what I'm achieving. I know everybody says we're the best program around, and I, we are the best program around, but I'll quote somebody, somebody who said, I know we're the best program in this state for children in the child welfare system. We see every day the impacts we have on families in terrible distress in their children. But to be honest with you, somewhere between one out of four and one out of three of the families we serve, we have no impact on whatsoever. We're desperate for new ideas, and we're desperate for people who know science who want to talk with us and help us figure out new things to try. And that, the analog for the development of the drug is that the policy arena can't say, okay, good, you guys get together, I give you a year, give me the answer, right? It doesn't work that way. But this is the frontier. This is the future of science coming together with, with policy and practice. So I'll give you one example of why this seems like a good road to go down. We have a meta-analytic database we just completed. It took us three years to build it. Um, it's all the programs that have been done and studied in the last 47 years, from the prenatal period up to school age. Something like 20,000 published papers and uh, government documents, and when you call out the high-quality studies, it very quickly gets down to a much more manageable number. It's kind of a lot of not very useful stuff, but we found um, 84, I think it was 88, our early childhood education programs, high quality studies, either RCTs or high quality quasi-experimental studies over the last 47 years. And we looked at their impact on cognitive skills and pre-academic skills at the time kids um, started school. So this is what the effect sizes were across these 88 programs for programs that had no involvement with parents. On cognitive skills, they got an effect size of approaching 0.3. That's kind of what you get all the time when you do this stuff in, in that world, and a lesser impact on early reading and math foundational skills. If we looked at those programs that had a parent component, but it was a passive component, like a parenting class where parents were given information, this is not statistically different from the other. It, it basically didn't have any impact. We then looked at that subgroup of programs that had active modeling and coaching, working with parents on skill building. And this is what it did to the outcomes, okay? So this is, this is the opportunity here, but here's the challenge. How much impact is this having on the field? Most programs don't have coaching for parents, and a lot of people don't know how to do that, and it costs more. And people, it's, then there are no incentives to do those things. So um, how many more decades are we going to have money going into programs that give parents information when they need to have skills built? This is where science can be very powerful to help us understand why this matters, to make that explanation the way Pat talked about our experience, but also get roll up our sleeves, get down on the ground. And this is just the beginning of the challenge. What are these skills? How do you build them? How do you measure them? Where are they in the brain? What are the sensitive periods? How, how much can you change those skills at what age? 
All those questions have to be answered. It can't just go, go build skills. Good luck. We're behind you. The science community salutes what you're doing. This is where we need that partnership. So let me end by saying that, that um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say something very negative and end on a high note, okay? Because I, too, am a pediatrician, so I'm congenitally an optimist, and I believe <laughs> that I believe that we can do great things for kids, okay? Um, the, all of this science will basically accomplish very little if we just use it as a justification to keep doing the same things we're doing. It will take us nowhere. It'll get more money for programs, um, more people will be employed in programs, but it's not gonna push a change that's gonna produce the kind of greater impacts that we all wanna see. So we need, this is a field that has no R&D platform. It has no R&D dimension. Biomedical research has an R&D dimension. At any point in time, we make sure people get state-of-the-art care but there are people in the back room who are saying state-of-the-art care isn't getting a good enough impact. We want better and better. The military dramatically changes what it does over time. Business, the leading corporations in whatever field they're in are spending some part of their budget to figure out where the field is going to go next and be the first ones there. They, can, they cannot be sustained on just doing the same things. We are doing the same things that were figured out 50 years ago with modifications. No major new theories of change, no major new ideas. And the way this is going to move the field forward is by scientists and practitioners working together on the ground. And we've already started to do that. So I can tell you it works. And the scientists enjoy it as much as the practitioners. It has to be driven by very robust theory that's grounded in the frontier of our understanding of how brain development moves forward and how it's affected by stress. And it must be accompanied by rigorous measurement of, of short-term, medium-term, mediating variables, long-term variables, and not measures of how much people like the program, and not measures of how many new people are getting in the program, and how many people have stayed with it. That's, this is bringing hard-nosed scientific thinking into a world that is dealing with these problems, and actually I'll tell you that we've, we've touched an untapped nerve. There is a hunger out there for science to help think of new ways to do things, not just to have science go and testify to a committee and tell people that what you're doing is really important. So um, I'll end with my thanks. I am standing on so many shoulders, oh my God, between the National Scientific Council and the National Forum on Early Childhood Policy and Practice, um, you know, the, some of the best researchers in the country in, in the biological sciences, people in the social sciences, and the Frontiers of Innovation is this new initiative that we began three years ago to basically put science on the ground to kind of put ourselves up against the wall and say we are constructive, lovingly and constructively dissatisfied with what we're accomplishing and the things we're doing right now. So I'm finished. Thanks very much. Okay. Any questions? Maybe we'll have to yeah. um, I really question. enjoyed your talk a lot. One of the most significant problems is the assessment. You know, teachers are human beings and they don't like to be evaluated. Accountability is something which just goes a grain against the grain of wh whether we're worthy people or not. Right. And when I have tried to start programs with Harvard and MIT um, in developing charter schools, when you put in the assessment component to show accountability at the empirical level, the look on the, the face of the evaluators is aghast. Right. Changing that perspective that it's okay to screw up is one of the fundamental things that I think needs to be changed. And I just wanted to emphasize yeah. that point. It's so irritating. No, absolutely. So let me, let me jump on the irritation bandwagon. If we, if we don't figure out, the, the answer actually is simple in concept but tough to implement. The answer is to create an environment that makes it safe to try things and fail and learn from failure. If the environment isn't safe to do that, we're doomed, okay? Which means we have to figure it out. And if you think about any drug company or biotech firm, if, if they basically made it unsafe for people in the company to try things that didn't work, they would go out of business pretty quickly. But the other thing about assessment that's really important is this is a field where we, we measure too many things, right? And that's, that's, a, this, that's code for if we measure enough things and we find some impacts on something, we can declare success, right? So um, you look at the indicators, people have like 50, 60, 70 indicators impact. We need a short list of indicators and outcomes that matter 
We need to create an environment that will be encourage people to try things and learn from failure, and we will move this field rapidly to another place. And if we don't, 100 years from now, we're going to be, have a much more sophisticated science in the same gaps with no improvement. Yeah. I, I have a question. A, a number of years ago, when I was involved in this sort of thing, there, I was told about a study by the Visiting Nurse Association of America. And it was first envisioned as a, a really complex study. Go in, talk to the pregnant mothers, tell them how. And then the funding got cut. Some, in some cities, it was picked up and they followed the kids up through high school. And then in others, it just ended with the end of pregnancy. And then somebody there who was a representative of some nursing association said, well, you know, we did do a study. Um, of the kids, of the mothers who got left at the termination of pregnancy. And they had a, 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 a much higher than normal um, number, a, a percentage of finishing high school mm -hmm. than even the, well, it was, I think it was equal to the kids who had been followed, right? So mm -hmm. what, what that says is you have to make the mothers feel important. You know, it would be nice to make fathers feel important, but let's face it, the mother is the one who's going to have the right. earliest contact. Right. Uh, and I, does, has anybody ever followed that later in life? <laughs> that, that particular study? Do or that study the, I, I don't, but I, the, the, the home visiting field, you know, had the iconic study in that field is the nurse family partnership, which has decades of really good data from randomized controlled trials in multiple cities uh, showing uh, positive impacts on a variety of measures that matter. It starts in pregnancy and it ends at the child's second birthday and most of the measured impacts have been on decreased emergency room utilization, hospitalizations in the first couple of years, referrals for abuse or neglect and the mothers have increased the spacing in their pregnant to the next pregnancy and they're smoking less, all those kinds of things. But, um, and David Olds, who's kind of engineered that, who's done a great job, will be the first to tell you because they're now really pushing that to scale it. Um, because it has great data, but what they're finding is that in some communities where there are very high levels of intimate partner violence or substance abuse or depression, um, that program is not working as well as it did in a high-risk population that didn't have a lot of those problems. That's not a negative comment on the intervention. It's a positive statement about the fact that there's no one-size-fits-all model here and that we have to keep pushing and learning. But home visiting is very popular right now. It's in the new health care law. Um, and um, the issue is like everything else. We have to think of whatever the state of the art is right now, that should be our starting point for thinking about now where do we go next. While most of the field goes to scale and does what best practices are, there needs to be a part of the field heavily populated by scientists who are kind of trying to figure out what's next rather than just, because scientists are not going to weigh in on scaling programs. That's a different expertise. Um, but there has to continue to be the what's next, what, this insatiable determination to keep getting better and better. Um, and we don't have that, and we need to build it in. Think about if we, if we applied the same criteria to the, well, the war, the, war on, the, the war against cancer, that was the Nixon administration, right? War on cancer. It's a little bit, it has a little shorter life than the war on poverty. Um, I don't think anybody is ready to kind of say, well, there's no point in continuing to work on cancer research anymore. All these decades, we haven't cured everything. It's like we, we won't stop until we get there. Why should we be selling ourselves down the river on the impacts of adversity? It's just that we haven't provided the same incentives. We haven't allowed people to... Something yeah. wrong with your brain, it's your fault. If and you if you're poor, it's your fault. Right? Right. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you.